Hello class and welcome to this lecture on utility and consumer choice in our course on principles of microeconomics. To give you a roadmap of what we're going to discuss in this lecture, we're going to do a brief recap of demand. We'll then talk about the budget constraint. We'll introduce the concept known as utility and we'll compare that to marginal utility and figure out how we can make optimal choices given a finite set of income and a few set of choices. We'll then graph indifference curves, and then we'll talk about labor supply, and then we'll finish the discussion by deriving market demand. So essentially what this lecture is going to cover is you're going to see that really economics is about maximizing overall welfare or satisfaction given a limited scarce amount of resources. And so overall market demand is very simple. But in order to actually derive that, there's a lot of complicated utility factors and mechanisms going on behind the scenes. So to talk about utility and consumer choice, we can talk about the determinants of demand. And we can also talk about the income effect and the substitution effect. So if you remember, the income effect was the change in quantity demanded as a result in a change in the price of a product. And the substitution effect was the change in quantity demand due to a change in the price of, uh, of a product. Uh, the former was based on it affecting your overall purchasing power. And the latter was focused on basically um, its relative price to other goods and services that you could substitute it with. And these are going to be paramount in determining our overall individual demand and our overall utility because of the fact that we have a limited amount of money and we have limited resources. And so basically when these things change, it affects our overall way in which we're gonna allocate resources. And that's how we understand the true nuances of this, this concept. So how do we decide what we buy? Well, these three factors must be considered and it kind of goes back to the first lecture where I talked about what gets produced, how it gets produced, and who receives it. But basically, when you are deciding kind of how you're going to allocate your budget, you figure out what are the things that you want, what are the things that you need. You're then going to decide how much labor you're going to supply because for the most part, most individual income comes from labor uh, and working at a job. So some of us have an endowment of money from a retirement account maybe or family members or some other account but generally speaking most of our day-to-day -day purchases and living expenses are based on the amount of money we earn when we work not based on some fund that you may or may not have and then lastly we have to figure out how much we're going to save because not only do we want to focus on being able to buy something right now but we also want to be able to possibly buy something in the future and that is very important in determining whether or not, uh, excuse me, how much we actually have in a given period to consume. So just to recap the determinants of demand. So again, price matters and that we'll see that income matters. Um, and then prices of related goods. So things that we can purchase instead tastes and preferences so what makes us like something or not like something and expected future prices all of those were the things that we fo we, we focused on and talked about but we also have overall wealth and expected future income and wealth so wealth is kind of an endowment like i said before the total accumulation of assets that you have so income is just kind of how much money is coming in in a given period and wealth is the overall accumulation of that. So that's why I talked about savings in the last slide because of the fact that you might end up saving for the future and that savings is gonna limit your current consumption but it's gonna expand your future consumption because your wealth is going to increase. And then your expected future income and wealth. So maybe you're starting a new job in the future that's paying more than the current job. Well, you can anticipate possibly expanding how much you purchase because you know you'll have that money in the future even if you don't exactly have it right now. So again, uh, there's more to the story. We have to talk about basically changing variables affecting quantity uh, demanded um, and we have limited resources, that's obvious. 
as a result of a limited number of resources or a scarce amount of income or wealth, households have to make a budget. Uh, the first day of class, I talked about how we have unlimited wants and limited resources. That is the exact same problem that society has at an individual level. The accumulation of all of our wells together is not enough. So obviously one person's wealth is not going to be enough either. And so we're basically imposed by what's going to be known as a budget constraint. And a budget constraint is the limits that are imposed on household choices by wealth, income, and prices. There's millions of products. There are millions of things that you could spend your money on. You could spend your money on car washes. You can spend your money on a car. You can spend your money on a house. You can spend your money on groceries. You can spend your money on a phone. You can spend your money on toothpaste. You can spend your money on gambling. You can spend your money on uh, a puppy. You can spend your money on so many different things. But overall, you have to figure out, given the budget that you have, how you're going to choose from all of those options to maximize your overall utility and satisfaction and functionality of the budget that you have. And that's really what this whole lecture is about. It's about that problem. It's about taking what we have and allocating it appropriately that is the most efficient means possible. And so what we're going to talk about is going to seem strange and not really economics, but more philosophy. But there's still some mathematical components to it that help demonstrate the concept. And even though we technically probably won't be able to measure it in a real uh, setting, you can take these elements and, and ideas and implement them into your own life in terms of making decisions. So here's an example of a budget constraint. Uh, Cindy has a job where she earns $1,400 per month after taxes. So no savings, no wealth. Pretty much they have $1,400 to spend in any given month. So there's a bunch of bundles. So there's more than just A, B, C, and D. There's E and F and G and H and all the way through the alphabet a million times of combinations that you could uh spend your money on some of them you don't care about same with the oppor think about the opportunity cost concept again uh, other ones you do care about but in terms of actual opportunities there are some that you can't actually afford so there are some that you can't physically pay for so those aren't going to be part of your decision making process or at least they shouldn't be and so here we have four bundles that Cindy can choose from. Bun uh, Cindy can bundle rent, food, and some other things, and the accumulation of those will be her total cost relative to her job and her income. So bundle A has her living in an $850 place per month, uh, $200 for food and $350 for other things. Maybe it's... Uh, savings or travel or entertainment or gas or whatever she needs. The accumulation of all that is $1,400 if you add across the columns, which means that bundle A is actually affordable. So Cindy could consider bundle A in her opportunity set or choice set. You might hear either term use. They're the same thing. Bundle B has Cindy spending a little bit more on rent for a nicer place, but is really eating nothing pretty much for $3 a day for food and spending $300 on other things because they would rather have entertainment and the other needs than eating lavishly every single day. And this total across the columns is there is also $1,400. So B is still part of her choice set. C, uh, getting a much more uh, economical apartment so they can eat out more and enjoy more things. They're more focused on living and eating than having a, a big, fancy, luxurious apartment. And all of that accumulated is $1,400. So both A, oops, that's, let's use a different color here. Let's go A, B, and C are all within Cindy's choice set. But option D, the rent is already more than she makes in a month. Hardly eating any food and, any, and enjoying their life, they still can't even afford that apartment. So 
this one is out because the total amount is $1,700 and she only has $1,400. Now, if she had external wealth or assets that allowed for her to expand beyond what her actual income is, then it would be possible. But since we're assuming that not to be the case, then uh, A, B, and C are going to be the opportunity set or choice set for Cindy. So let's do an example. Barney and Ted are friends. After expensive New York City rent, they have $200 combined to spend on two activities. They can eat a meal at their favorite pub. I'm just going to guess it's called McLaren's. Or they could play laser tag. Laser tag costs $10 every time they go, and a restaurant meal costs $20 every time they go. With that information, we can actually derive a graph. And this graph is known as the budget constraint. So the budget constraint has both products on each, or one product in each at axis, so both products are graphed. We have on the x-axis laser tag. And so laser tag costs $10 every time. And we know that their budget is $200. And restaurant meals cost $20 every time, and since we know that their uh, budget is $200. We can graph those intercepts by taking the total amount of income that they have and dividing it by the price of each product. So if they only went to laser tag, they could go to laser tag 20 times. If they only went out to McLaren's, they could go out 10 times a month, given their budget. And so this simple equation of 10x plus 20y equals 200 is just saying basically the price times the number of times you go is equal to your budget constraint. That's the limitations. You could spend less than that, but you can't spend more than that. So basically think about the production possibilities frontier as it applies to an individual person in terms of their consumption instead of their production. And that's basically what you have with the budget constraint. So basically any combination of X and Y that is less than or equal to 200 is going to be encompassed by this triangle right here. So this whole triangle is basically the choice set for Barney and Ted. Anything outside of it they can't afford, so they can't do that. And everything inside of it is an option. So they could possibly go laser tag five times, go to a restaurant meal six times, and still have some money left over and not spend everything. But as economists, as budding economists, we're here to try and maximize overall satisfaction. And typically, we don't see uh, maximization occurring when we're not utilizing our entire budget. When we talked about the production possibilities frontier, we said that basically any point that was inside the line was inefficient because we weren't utilizing those scarce resources. So in a way, we can also treat our income as a scarce resource as well. And if we want to overall maximize our satisfaction or whatever it is we're trying to maximize in that period of time, the only way that's going to be maximized is if we utilize our entire budget. So typically, you're going to maximize your overall satisfaction or maximize your utility, which we haven't, I haven't even explained yet, when we are using our entire budget. So, But anyways, so that 10x corresponds to the price of x times x, and then 20 corresponds to the price of y times y. So every time the price changes, the budget constraint changes when we compare these, these products. Because instead of it just being, oh, we're moving along a given demand curve, we now just have a graph that says, okay, what are the combinations in restaurant meals and laser tag that I can afford? And every time the price of one of them changes, we now have to shift the entire budget constraint. It changes the entire underlying assumptions, which is why demand is much more complicated than you think, because as we'll learn, this doesn't tell us what we're going to consume yet because we don't know what is the best choice. So we know what the choices are, but the question now is what is the best choice? And without more analysis, we can't figure that out. But before we get to that analysis, I'll show you that 
the price is going to uh, the price change is going to affect your budget constraint. So that green line is the same budget constraint that we had before, where basically if laser tag was ten bucks and restaurant meals were twenty, then you could consume in that triangle. But if we lower the price of restaurant meals to ten dollars, maybe there's a half off coupon, then that expands the budget set or excuse me the choice set or opportunity set out it sh it kind of moves our budget constraint out further so our actual income didn't change but our purchasing power changed therefore we have more opportunities and our choice set goes up so that's why i said it's important to focus on the income effect and the substitution effect when prices change because we can see the income effect right here ceteris paribus because we can now go to more restaurant go to the restaurant more often, even if we played the same amount of laser tag in almost all cases. We won't see the substitution effect until we actually talk about utility. But you can kind of see where we're going with this, that also if you raise the price of laser tag, it shrinks the amount of opportunities that you have. It limits your, your purchasing power so you can't consume as much. So without looking at utility yet to actually figure out where we're going to optimize because again this is about optimization the last unit was about optimizing profits for firms now and, and at the very beginning was about optimizing a market for society now we're looking at optimizing your own personal budget so that way you get the most out of it that you possibly can so we can see the income effect here as the budget or the budget constraints going to move the choice sets going to expand or contract based on the change of prices went because remember we're not just choosing one thing now we're choosing bunches of things so that's the tricky part here is like we're used to being like okay here's the market for televisions but the market for televisions is also impacted by the market for donuts in a way because of the fact that it impacts everything changing impacts your overall budget there's a story about how if you go to a grocery store um, if you go to like Walmart or any other grocery store, Meyer or uh, Safeway or uh, Kroger or any sort of grocery store chain, a lot of times what they'll have is they'll have like a little shop. Once in a while, they have a shopping cart in the grocery section and they say like, this is what we bought at this grocery store that's a competitor of ours. And here's the receipt. I taped it to the thing. Look how expensive it is. The same shopping cart here is like 90 bucks instead of $130. Well, that may be true, but the reality is, is that when you go shopping through the store, sometimes you go to a specific store for the specific sales, or as you see the prices are different at that store, it adapts. You end up adapting what you purchase. So you wouldn't actually buy the same things at Kroger as you would at Aldi or what or what you would buy at Safeway as what you would buy at Meyer, buy what at Walmart, which you would buy at Target, because your demands might be different based on how the prices affect that relative to your budget. So when you see those things, yeah, it might be cheaper, but I might not be interested in buying those same things because I don't get the same level of happiness or usefulness out of it that someone else might. Or because I found something really cheaper here, I'm willing to take the trade off of the fact that something else might be more expensive because I don't want to have to deal with the travel cost of going to another place. So what's the best bundle? That's the real question that I have now is we know how much money we have. We know what we can choose from. But the real question is, what do we choose? We have a bunch of choices. But which one's the best? That's what we care about. Just like it wasn't enough for us to just analyze if a firm was making money or not, we got to figure out where they're maximizing their profits. Uh, because marginal analysis allows for the most efficient means of production in most cases. So we're going to be looking for the best bundle. And I've said utility about 30 times, but I actually haven't introduced the concept. Basically, utility is the first step in determining that optimal comp, uh, consumption bundle. And really, all utility is is the enjoyment or satisfaction received from consuming a good or service. Because why would you buy something if you didn't like it? Why would you buy something if it didn't give you satisfaction? 
even if it, you might be buying it for someone else who gets satisfaction from it, uh, well, hopefully you're getting utility from the fact that the other person is satisfied uh, and the like it offsets or something like that. So I think back to when I was uh, before I was born, uh, my mother uh, had uh, was married and to my father and my father uh, had a pet tarantula and my mom is afraid of spiders and she decided I'm still going to take care of this thing even though I'm terrified of it and I hate it and it's ugly and it's fuzzy and it's furry and it makes a bunch of creepy webs in a terrarium because of the fact that uh, she derived utility from the fact that the spider was making the her spouse happy. So um utility generally speaking though is a arbitrary concept it's i want to say it's fully arbitrary it's arbitrary in the fact that we can't quantify it so it's not to say it's arbitrary because it's got some pretty strong mathematical conventions that defend it um but in terms of actually measuring it and quantifying it between people is impossible um so like you could potentially quantify utility individually in your own way where you can kind of weigh things and that's really what you do on a daily basis and that's what you're going to do here but if i was to say okay like i eat oreo cookies and the way it makes me happy is the same way it makes my wife happy or the same way it makes someone else happy doesn't necessarily translate it doesn't so uh, eating three cookies might make me happier than it makes someone else eating three cookies of the same thing. So utility is philosophical in a way, but it hopefully kind of brings you back to realize that economics isn't just about money. It never has and it never will be. I mean, the wealth of nations, yeah, I guess it was about money, but economics is more of a tool set and a thought process. So basically, utility is going to be a concept that allows for us to understand how, where demand comes from. So when we see demand in nature, we don't have a crazy model that basically derives it like we're going to have here. And if you were to take intermediate micro or, or a core micro graduate sequence. But um, you can understand how the concept creates demand. We're going to look at it from like if, if you're running a business or if you're in marketing, you're going to be looking at it from data that you can extrapolate some sort of pattern from. But in terms of utility itself, if we were to do it from scratch, uh, it wouldn't really be feasible because we don't know how to actually quantify these things in reality. But long story short, bar, uh, utility is just the enjoyment or satisfaction. We will give it numbers and we will give it units. But uh, as I like to say, it's like the TV show Whose Line Is It Anyway? Whether you watch the old, old version, the Drew Carey version, or the modern version, basically everything is made up and the points don't matter. Uh, the numbers in, w are made up, but they actually do matter in a way because of the fact that... Um, they help us get to a decision. And that's really what you're looking for is you're trying to figure out what is the best decision for me. So utility is our way of getting there. So this slide just kind of goes through what I just said. Basically, uh, we can't uh, actually um, quantify it between people. We all have unique preferences. And so everyone's going to have a different utility function. So even when we have graphs, sometimes we assume that people are the same, but they're really not. But anyways, um, utility is impossible to quantify. Uh, you can make up numbers in your head, just be like, you know what, that makes me this happy and this makes me more happy. So you can do it ordinally and be like, well, this makes me the happiest, then this makes me the next happiest, and then this makes me the next happiest. Or you could just make up numbers on your own and then do that as well um but we're always doing this so like when you're trying to decide okay should i go for the thing that makes me happiest or should i go for the thing that makes me like the fourth happiest but is the most affordable 
those are the things that we're basically proving here. You've done them your entire life, and you're going to continue to do them for the rest of your life. But having a little bit of a kind of a, a box to wrap around that concept and have you more consciously thinking of it and more aware of it might help you be more efficient in your decision making process. So the reality is, is that utility is not linear. What I mean by that is that utility is not going to be constant all the way through. It's not going to always perpetually increase. The reality is, is because we have a, a time crunch typically when we're analyzing these things. If we're using a budget constraint, we're usually looking at one month or one pay period or something like that. So if you do something a bunch, then over your lifetime, that's fine. But over a two week period, maybe you're not going to get the same level of satisfaction. So this goes back to the very beginning of the course when I said, OK, when you're trying to figure out what is the optimal amount to run, well, there's not really a dollar value that you can attach to that, but you can feel it out based on how much uh, energy you exert and how much how what kind of results you're getting from that exercise. So you don't want to go try and run 26 miles today. That's not going to be good because after a certain period of time, you're going to get diminishing returns or negative returns because you're going to end up hurting yourself because your body's not ready for it. Same thing applies here. The overall, what you're trying to do is you're trying to maximize total utility, just like you were trying to maximize profit as a uh, business. But our optimal decision is going to be made using marginal analysis, just like before marginal revenue equals marginal cost determines our optimal decision. Marginal utility is going to be kind of the deciding factor or, or a piece of the deciding factor that helps you figure out what is your best combination of goods and services given your budget constraint to maximize your overall welfare. And so marginal utility is just the additional satisfaction received from consuming one more unit of a good or service. So total utility is what you're trying to maximize. It's the total across all units consumed, and they don't even, even have to be the same product. Uh, but marginal utility is the additional satisfaction that you get from consuming one more unit of a specific good or service. Now the reality is, is we have something that's known as diminishing margin utility. I, I highlighted that with the exercise example, but just think about eating as well. So uh, if you're listening to this lecture and you were eating a snack while doing it, uh, at the beginning, we're about almost a half an hour in, so maybe, uh, unless you paused it, but we're almost about a half an hour in, so let's just say that you um, stopped eating 15 minutes in. Well, either A, you stopped eating because you ran out of it, but in the concept of, let's say you have an entire bag of chips, you decided after 15 minutes you didn't want to eat anymore, either because you were full or maybe the, the flavor in your mouth got to be too repetitive or too intense or, or for whatever reason, but you decided to stop. And the reason why was because you weren't getting the same level of satisfaction as you were initially. And that happens in a given short frame of time, uh, doing the same thing over and over again is not going to yield you the same level of satisfaction every single time. So it might be, ta might be appropriate for you to switch to some other activity or some other project to continue those things. So this is why we don't run 50 miles every time we work out and we don't go out and party every night. At least I don't, maybe you do, but uh, I would get diminishing margin utility just probably doing it two nights in a row. But anyways, uh, sport seasons are just seasonal as well, um, mainly because of the fact that there would be a diminishing margin utility to the fact that, okay, if the season is just perpetual and nobody ever wins, then are we just a hamster in a wheel or is there any sort of finality to it? So um, 
that's the reality is is that those are part of the reasons why those things are in place is because of the fact that doing the same thing forever over and over again will not yield you the same level of satisfaction as it once did and that will affect how much you're willing to pay for it so here's an example with cookie monster uh he i don't feel like using his entire voice all the time but me cookie monster and me love cookies he you can read the rest of the text in his voice but basically what's going on is cookie monster has a certain number of cookies that he can eat and so if cookie monster eats no cookies then there's no satisfaction that comes from it and then remember margin utility is the additional satisfaction that you get from consuming one more unit of a good or service now we're going to assume there's no budget here just for the sake of proving that there is diminishing margin utility so there's still a, an optimizing decision even if you have a limited budget at least for a specific good now if you have the option of every good then there is no limit but if you're just looking at one specific product then there is a limit actually technically there is a limit and the other one is just that you would probably consume so many things that you would never be able to actually experience diminishing marginal returns on everything but anyways once cookie monster eats the first cookie uh they now have a total utility of 10 between zero and one so the mars utility is the difference so it's 10. They eat the second cookie their total utility jumps from 10 to 17 so that means that specific second cookie was worth seven units of additional satisfaction for them the third cookie their total utility jumps up to 21 and then they get four additional units so notice that the overall satisfaction is increasing but not at the same rate and that will be very important if you're actually having to pay for every single unit and you have a limited budget so kind of keep that in mind they get to the fourth cookie and they're marginally happier they're one unit happier whatever the unit is uh, but then they eat the fifth cookie and then eventually he gets a tummy ache because he ate too many cookies and then he loses some of his overall satisfaction because of the fact that uh, the cookie the last cookie was just too made him too full and they just didn't really enjoy it so their actual margin utility was negative so eating things that even eating things that you love like cookie monster eating cookies doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get happier forever because there's a finite limitation that's happening there so that shows you that there's diminishing margin utility but now what we're going to do is we're going to add a layer of complexity to it which basically harkens back to the budget constraint we now have to put in a budget and then we have to put in more than one choice so i won't make it so that you have to choose between 17 different things but i'll let you but if you can choose between two different things the same concept applies to 17 or 7000 it doesn't matter but basically if you have a limited budget and you have more than one thing to choose from then the comp the analysis becomes a little trickier not too difficult but a little trickier so when we have budgets and we have a limited amount or excuse me multiple options to choose from we instead want to focus on marginal utility per dollar so marginal utility per dollar is just the additional satisfaction per dollar spent so put simply it's basically just taking the marginal utility you calculated before and dividing it by the price so if each cookie was two dollars then you have you had 10 7 4 uh 1 and negative 2 as your marginal utilities for the previous uh slide you would then to calculate your mu over p you would do 10 over 2 which is 5 7 over 2 which is three and a half four over two which is two one over two which is neg or is one half and then this would be negative one so your marginal utility per dollar is going to be different it's basically trying to scale out how much additional satisfaction you get for every dollar that you spend because everything isn't free if the cookies were free that would be great but if the cookies cost money then you have another problem on your hands because every time you 
buy something, you're giving up something else. And you want to make sure that the what you're giving up isn't worth more than the what you're buying instead. Does that make sense? I hope it does, um, because I don't know right now if you understand or not. But if you do have questions about it, again, feel free to ask. This leads us to our utility maximization rule. So this will make a lot more sense when we do an example, which we will. But basically what it's saying is assuming that um, you can afford a certain amount, the utility maximizing rule is to continue purchasing until you get to the point where the additional margin utility per dollar of the last unit that you buy of every good is the same. So if you had 17 goods, the margin utility per dollar of the last of good one is going to be the same as the last of good two, the last of good three, the four, five, all the way through 17. That's not to say that your overall satisfaction from each one is going to be the same. And it's not to say that you're going to consume the same amount of each one in terms of the number of units or the number of times that you access it. What it does say is that at the last time you do it, so maybe after the 12th concert and the third basketball game and the fifth pizza, all of those things gave you the same dollar for dollar level of satisfaction the last time that you consumed it. So the last concert and the last basketball game and the last pizza didn't cost the same, didn't give you the same level of total utility, but they gave you the same additional utility per dollar spent every time you did that thing the last time. And so that's really what it's saying is that basically uh, the value that you got for the last time you consumed something was the same across all goods. That's really what the utility maximizing rule is. If that, in reality, does that work out the same? Not necessarily, because you might get this inconsistency where based on the price of something, you might not be able to buy that last unit. You might not be able to afford that last unit. You might not be able to buy, spend every dollar that you have because the last unit that maximizes overall utility is not uh, affordable. Or... What you could do is you could skip this rule so you could buy something else that you can't afford so you're at your budget constraint. But notwithstanding that, assuming a perfect world in an artificial universe, this is the rule that will hold true. And I think I've cooked up a problem that will allow for it to be true. So here's an example that we can use to try and find the optimal consumption bundle. So again, in reality, you've got hundreds of things, thousands of things that you're trying to decide between. But here, you only have an option of two. You can either go to a concert or you can go to a basketball game. So a concert costs $4, so let's mark that right here. And a basketball game is $5. Or a basketball L game is $5. So if you do nothing, uh, you get no satisfaction. And also we need to mind, I mean, to bring your attention to the fact that the budget constraint is $17, which means that you are trying to figure out what is the way to maximize the overall total utility across all goods. So that's saying, so you're going to add utilities across products, which in reality you can't really do, but but we're going to say that you can because this is an individual making a decision and you could theoretically come up with your own algorithm that calculates values, but whatever. So what we're getting at here is we're trying to maximize total utility. That's the goal of this process. Maximize total utility across all products. So that means that the sum of the pro the sum of the total utilities when we have finally settled on how many concerts we're going to and how many basketball games we're going to, that maximizes total utility given our budget constraint. So the first step, there are two ways in which you can do this process. I will go through the original way that I learned how to do this. 
that I think is actually harder now that I really thought about a different way to solve this problem. So the first way you can do this is to find all combinations where the margin utilities per dollar are equal because we know that our utility maximizing rule is to find all of the find the combination where the margin utilities per dollar are the same when they finish their last uh, product. So what you can do is you can uh, this problem is really easy because there's only one of them. There is a, a margin utility per dollar that is three at three concerts for uh, this uh, side. And there's a margin utility per dollar that's equal to three for one basketball game. So in reality, I could cook up a problem where there's four or five different combinations where the margin utilities per dollar are equal. And if that's the case, then you, what you want to do is you want to pull aside those combinations. So it could be like two and one or three and five or four and four. All of them have the same margin utility per dollar at the end. The next step that you would do is you would you would take the cost of that. So let's say we did five, four concerts and two basketball games. Well, four concerts is $16 and two basketball games is 10. So that's 26 bucks and we can't afford that. So you would eliminate that combination. So any combinations that were less than or equal to your budget constraint, you would consider any that are greater than your budget, you would just throw out. And then from that point, you would just calculate the total utility of all of those combinations and pick the combination that gives you the highest number. What I think is easier is to just go element by element and basically be like, okay, well, I'm choosing from these two options. What I'm going to choose first is the one that gives me the highest marginal utility per dollar. So I'm going to go one step at a time and walk through the steps until I run out of money. That's basically what I'm going to do. I'm going to go on a journey and be like, okay, I, have, I just got paid. I have $17. What do I do with it? Well, I have the choice between going to concerts and going to basketball games. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the thing that gives me the highest additional satisfaction for the price. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare margin utility per dollar between the two columns at the first unit. So I so again, we're not looking at total utility right now. We're not looking at margin utility right now. We're looking at margin utility per dollar. So there could be a case where you have to actually calculate margin utility per dollar before you do this, where you just take margin utility and divide it by price. Not very hard. Uh, and then basically for the rest of it, then you're just looking at that last column in each for each good. So if we see that margin utility per dollar is five for the first concert, and it's only three for the first basketball game, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the concert because it gives me more satisfaction. That concert cost me $4, so now I'm down to $13. So the next step is now I have to compare the second concert to the first basketball game. I don't compare the first bat or concert anymore because that's already been done and we don't have linear reactions to consumption. Uh, so you have to keep going down the rows once you've finished one off. You're not gonna get the same level of utility every time because of diminishing marginal returns. So now I'm gonna compare the second concert to the first basketball game. Well. The second concert gives me four units, additional units of satisfaction per dollar. The basketball game is still yielding me only three, so I'm going to go to another concert. So that lowers it down to nine. The next option, we have to look at the third concert versus the first basketball game. And both of them yield you the same margin of utility per dollar. With that information, you're indifferent between the two. It doesn't matter which one you go to. So in that case, maybe you go to the one that gives you the highest total utility or marginal utility at that point, which is the basketball game. 
So you would go to the basketball game. That costs you five bucks, so you're down to four dollars. You then compare the third concert to the second basketball game. You see that the third concert gives you three units of satisfaction additional per dollar, while the second basketball game only gives you 1.8. So you decide to go to a third concert, and that's going to run you to zero. So now that you're out of money, you just see how many concerts you went to, how many basketball games you went to, and then you realize that your optimal bundle was to go to three concerts and one basketball game. And to figure out your total utility, you're just going to add this value of total utility that corresponds to three concerts plus the total utility that corresponds to one. So you get 48 plus 15, and your total utility is 63 units. You could go through the table as much as you want, there are combinations that yield you higher utility total, but you can't afford them. So uh, the optimal decision given your, given your budget constraint is going to be that three concert, one basketball game bundle. Going back to that budget constraint that I showed you with Ted and Barney, you can actually calculate or visualize the optimal consumption bundle by using what's known as an indifference curve. So an indifference curve basically measures fixed levels of utility at an infinite number of potential consumption bundles. So yeah, you could have fraction. So indifference curves imply fractions of units for goods and services that are discrete numbers. So there's some weirdness to them. But generally what the optimal decision is going to be is each indifference curve represents a fixed level of utility. So there's an indifference curve that represents 63 units like we saw on the last slide. There's an indifference curve that represents 50. There's an indifference curve that represents 20. But they're all parallel to each other, so none of them intersect. But... What happens is, is if you aren't at your optimal decision, you could consume, say, here, or you could consume here, and you're getting the same level of utility, but you're not paying the same amount of money for it. So you could be like, well, I'm spending my whole budget, and I'm on the line, but the reality is, is that there's another point that can get you the same level of satisfaction that costs just as much. And in fact, there are combinations that cost even less to get the same level of utility. And so that's not your best choice. Your best choice is going to be a point where the utility indifference curve is tangent to your budget constraint, meaning that it only touches at that one point. Anything beyond it, you can't afford. Anything inside of it, you could attain twice and or get it at a lower price. So point A in the green indifference curve represents the maximum level of utility for that uh, option. So if we use the previous example, what it's going to say is uh, we'll put concerts on the X, we'll put basketball games on the Y. So if we had $17 and it was $4 for a concert, let's say they're divisible. Let's say you could go to a quarter at a time. You could go to 4.25 concerts or you could go to 3.4 go to 3.4 basketball games and then you connect those two points and that's your budget constraint and we decided based on our analysis that three concerts and one basketball game is going to give us 63 units and that's the point that's tangent to this curve there are other combinations you could have done that give you less, but this one here gives you 63 units and represents your maximization. 
So you can actually graph what we just did on these indifference curves to demonstrate how they work. And that point right there is the only point that's tangent to the curve. Everything else is not feasible. And all the other combinations that you could have had are actually worth less. So as a result, um, you end up not maximizing when you're not maximizing your budget. One thing that I wanted to talk about was the amount of labor that you supply dictates your income, which can have an impact on your opportunity set. So I briefly wanted to talk about labor supply and the concept of the fact that um, there's a little bit of weirdness to it. Um, it's not a traditional supply curve that you would see. It's assumed to have what's known as a backwards bend. But figuring out how much you're going to work is an important determinant in how much you end up making, which is a determinant in how much your budget constraint is, which is a determinant of how much you buy, which it basically creates your demand. So taking what we took from the previous uh, discussion with the budget constraint and the indifference curve and the optimal solution, that is the information that we need to actually derive individual demand. So here we're talking about labor supply. So labor supply is considered to have a backwards bend because of the fact that there's a income substitution effect thing going on as your wage gets higher and higher. The amount of labor that we actually supply is based on the availability of jobs, the market wage rates, and the skills possessed by the labor force. So again, if there's no jobs available in your field, then you might not um, be able to work as much as you'd like to, which limits your income, which limits your overall budget constraint. Uh, wage rates can also impact how much labor you supply. So if it's paying at a low wage rate and it's really all you got, then you're probably going to work a lot more. So you'll make a decent amount, but not as much as you'd like. Um, and then the skills possessed by the labor force dictate, okay, how many people are actually qualified. So the reason why pro athletes or, or the such make high salaries is because they have one, the firm has a marginal revenue product of labor that's really high, meaning that they make a lot of money when that person does well, coupled with the fact that there aren't a lot of people that can do what those pro athletes do. So there's lots of people that go and play in college, play in high school, play in middle school, even play professionally. But for the ones that get paid the most, they are so specialized and unique that uh, they command a high salary. But as I mentioned before, the amount you get paid also results in this eventual backwards bend to that labor supply curve. So I showed it before. It looks like this, and then it go, It looks like a regular supply curve for the most part, but then it starts to cut back after a certain wage rate. That certain wage rate is very high. Um, so most of us are going to be operating in this range of the supply curve, but maybe you become a CEO or in some lucrative position and you end up in that high tier where basically you realize that like after a while, you don't need the money anymore. Like you'd like to have more money, but the reality is, is that you can't really work a hundred hours a week. So maybe you're going to pay $700 an hour, but if you get paid $700 an hour, you don't really necessarily need to work 100 hours a week anymore because you're getting paid $700 an hour. So $700 an hour is $70,000 a week. So if you're getting paid $70,000 a week, or excuse me, $700 an hour, you don't necessarily need to work 100 hours to make $70,000 a week. It's going to run you ragged. And what's going to end up happening is you're going to value your leisure time and your free time more than the actual $700 an hour that you're making. And you're going to end up substituting some of that work for uh, time off. So that's why um, you're going to receive and you're also going to receive more utility from that leisure time than just from working constantly. So that's why there's this theoretical backwards bend. 
And then saving and borrowing also affects your consumption because if you decide that you want to put a down payment on a house in a year, you might not be interested in spending every single dollar that you earn. And so what's going to end up happening is if you decide to save for the future, what your budget constraint might have looked like this if you spent all your income, but you decide to put some away. And so in the current period, your budget constraint is going to be smaller and look like this. But in the next period, your budget constraint with your income would be the same, but because of the fact that you saved, you actually have this much when you add your wealth in to spend. So savers, what they'll do is they'll take a short term shrinkage or kind of compression of their or contraction of their um, budget constraint in the hopes for a expanded one in the future. Borrowers will do the opposite. Borrowers will borrow money and that will allow for them to, in the current period, have an expansion to their budget constraint from the blue line to the green line. But they're going to have to pay that back in interest and loan payments. So in the next period, if they didn't have that loan, they would have been at blue, but now they're at purple as a result. So saving and borrowing is also going to affect your consumption. Um, in the long run, or excuse me, not in the long run, but in a continuous period. So you can trade off some of your income now for purchases for something that's worth more or bigger later, um, or you can try and expand it now, but you're going to trade off some of your future income in exchange. So the question now is how do we get market demand from utility? So what we're going to do is we're going to go through that utility analysis, find the optimal consumption bundle given our budget constraint. The nice thing about that analysis is that you not only derive individual demand for one specific product, you derive individual demand for a bunch of products. So if we were trying to maximize our um, total utility, we aren't just making one decision to do one thing at once. We're trying to basically make that decision within the context of many other decisions. So when you change the price of one product, you're also going to affect the quantity demanded or the demand for another one. That's why we talked about the change in a price of a substitute or a complement resulting in a uh, shift of the curve. So like if the ch price of the iPhone changes and we're measuring the graph of the iPhone, that's going to move us along a given demand curve for the iPhone, but it's going to shift the demand curve for the Galaxy. And if the Galaxy changes its price, it's a substitution effect thing where we move along the Galaxy's demand curve, but we're going to shift the iPhone curve. The same thing's going to happen here. If it's between concerts and basketball games, you can treat them as substitutes. Based on the budget that that individual person had and the prices that were being offered, they were willing and able to pay $5 three times for concerts and, or $4 three times for concerts and $5 one time for a basketball. So you could take the individual demand at that price and plot it. So for concert or for basketball games, at five dollars they're willing to go once and then for the concerts at four dollars they're willing to go three times now before with the ted and barney example i showed you hit the price changes it changes the entire budget constraint which changes your overall utility function so maybe these go up to six and this goes up to six and then you end up going to uh zero and you go to two well now that you have two points you can connect a line and basically you end up with the demand curve individually for basketball and for concerts this is just for one person if we take many people's individual preferences 
So this is for concerts, this is for concerts, this is for concerts. You add up all of these points across, you end up deriving your market demand for concerts. So all of this was to basically show you all of the inner workings of demand. Oftentimes you just take it for granted, it's just given to you, it's downward sloping, we know why it is, but we don't really know where it's coming from. And really it's coming from individual choices based on a limited budget, scarce resources, and how much satisfaction they get from that product. And overall, that's how we end up with demand. So that demand curve that you had at the beginning of the course, in the middle of the course, the end of the course is all coming from this individual analysis aggregated out to the entire market. So that concludes this lecture. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Otherwise, best of luck on any assessments for me or any other course that you have. And I look forward to talking soon.